Dr. Nikolai Murashkin. Sorry. Uh, recording said, okay. Uh, so I'm delighted to have Dr. Nikolai Muraskin here with us. Um, he's a scholar of contemporary Japanese uh, foreign policy and international relations in the Asia Pacific. He's research fellow at JICA uh, Ogata Sodako Research Institute for Peace and Development in Tokyo. He did his PhD from Cambridge. Uh, so he's our, uh, part of our original cohort of Central Asianists. So we're delighted to have him here. He did his master's from Sciences Po in Paris. His current research interests include Japan's development cooperation and economic uh, statecraft, politics of connectivity, infrastructure and finance in the Indo-Pacific and Eurasian region, and international politics in Northeast Asia. So he's going to give his talk today on the not so new Silk Roads. Uh, Nikolai, the floor is yours. Many thanks. Uh, it's a huge pleasure and a delight and an honor for me to uh, to be speaking and to uh, sharing my research insights. I'm um, always grateful uh, to uh, Cambridge and the University and Cambridge Central Asia Forum uh, for all the various research opportunities that were unique uh, that uh, we, we, we've, we've shared and uh, uh, looking forward to collaborating in the future. I will share my slides right now. I hope that that works for you. Um, right, that works great. Okay, so um, here we go. Uh, well, many thanks uh, for Dr. for a uh, very kind introduction. I'll just add a few bits uh, to you know, explain my background. I'm originally from St. Petersburg, Russia. Uh, I, during my academic uh, training, I've, I've done some uh, studies in Cuba, Japan. And uh, when I was at Waseda University, I've met a lot of uh, JICA scholars, students who were in JICA scholarships from Central Asia in Japan. Uh, they were my uh, classmates, and there were quite many of them from Uzbekistan, uh, Kyrgyzstan, and other Central Asian countries. So that drew a personal interest in me, even though I already was interested in Central Asia and uh, Japan separately as, as, as regions in terms of culture and politics. And that drew, drew me to, uh, in, you know, incited, uh, how to put it, excited me enough to uh, embark on a PhD project about Japanese foreign policy in Central Asia and the New Silk Road. Now, uh, what I always try to highlight is that I've started uh, the project with that name before Belt and Road was announced. So uh, <laughs> when I started uh, doing research on Japan in Central Asia, uh, people were asking, well, why are you doing it on Japan? Why not on China? And I said, well, just because I'm interested in Japan specifically. Uh, but then Belt and Road kicked in and a lot of the Silk Road discourse, maybe not all of it, but a lot of it has became sort of retroactively repackaged as uh, somehow part of Belt and Road. Which is, you know, normal because you know, Belt and Road is a giant, uh, huge initiative and truly unprecedented, uh, no doubt. Uh, but uh, I also thought that it's interesting to see nuances and how, you know, different Silk Road projects existed uh, before that. Uh, not necessarily in competition. I don't mean to uh, emphasize any rivalry here. It, it's more just, you know, all alternate visions that are often actually having overlaps, and that's something that I also would like to uh, highlight in my talk. Now, this picture is uh, from uh, Uzbekistan uh, near Chankala in Hiva. Um, I won't comment on the historical content here, uh, but what I wanted to just draw your attention to is that there is a black dot. If you see Japan in the right hand side of the picture, there's a black dot indicating that Japan uh, was part of the uh, historical Silk Road, which is a well known fact. Uh, you know, we could look at Nara, uh, the capital that had interactions with the Tang dynasty or some people uh, usually quote the example of Osaka, which is a merchant port um, historically. But point being, uh, there is uh, you know, that historical link that is uh, often used in uh, historical discourses and academic discourses, uh, even maybe perhaps in some political pronouncements in Japan's diplomacy vis-a-vis -vis Central Asia, uh, to indicate that what I'll be uh, about to um, talk about, which is Japanese post-Soviet kind of um, Japanese foreign policy in post-Soviet Central Asia, that is something that doesn't just start in 1991. It's more of a sort of resuming some ties that uh, maybe have been there before. Now, of course, I'm, I'm not a historian, so I'm not gonna try to compare history and contemporary stuff. My interest is uh, Japanese contemporary foreign policy and is development and cooperation. Um, when I say that word development cooperation, in, you know, the easiest to, to put it is that I am talking about Japanese aid, foreign aid, uh, or overseas development assistance. However, in Japan, there is a preference towards that development cooperation term. 
uh, for a number of reasons, uh, because in a way it's it's uh, viewed as a even though Japan is part of the OECD DAC, uh, Organization for Economic Cooperation Developments, Development Assistance Committee, it's still a bit distinct from the way Western donors um, provide their aid, uh, namely the absence of political conditionality being uh, one of the, one of the uh, distinctive features. But this is something that uh, I would like to draw your attention uh, to perhaps explain some of the um, philosophy and approach be behind Japan's development cooperation. The reason for that is that Japan's development cooperation or Japan's aid is quite a big part of Japan's foreign policy towards Central Asia, as it is the case with Japan, uh, Japan's policy vis-a-vis -vis different countries in transition or uh, countries that are developing. So um, something that has been uh, quite often highlighted in, in Japan's official rhetoric uh, at JICA, here at JICA, is that Japan uh, was one of the first countries that were non-Western, with non-Western background, to have successfully undergone modernization all this here refers to specifically the Meiji era, the Meiji restoration or the Meiji revolution, depending on how you look at it. Uh, and uh, it was, it, it's one of the drivers that sort of uh, uh, pushes, apart from strategic considerations and aside from uh, you know, uh, economic considerations, one of the factors that pushes uh, or informs uh, Japan's approach in development cooperation and assistance with developing countries and countries in transition, such as uh, Central Asia. Now, what specifically does development cooperation refer to? Well, there are three components that are quite universally well known, not only in Japan uh, as a development cooperation, but also in other aid programs, that's loans, grants, and technical cooperation. Um, so some of the features of, uh, uh, I would like to offer a non-exhaustive list of some features of uh, Japan's development cooperation here, and later we can talk more about Central Asia. Uh, it is request-based, so the, this idea that it has to come from the from the recipient. Uh, it has this Gemba Shugi uh, philosophy, which is emphasis on local, uh, on, on the place where the uh, cooperation is needed. Uh, it focuses on poverty reduction a lot. This is definitely also the case of the multilateral development banks, such as the Asian Development Bank, the ADB, where Japan plays a quite a prominent role. Um, historically, has been playing a quite prominent role and then uh, when there is this sort of uh, chicken and egg debates about uh, modernization or you know uh, uh, what, what comes first economic prosperity or liberalization uh, in some uh, in some books or works by Japanese politicians uh, such as for instance the book by former prime minister uh, uh, Asotaro I think he emphasized that liberalization politically is important, but economic prosperity has to come first, or often should come first as a basis for that. Uh, and this is something that you don't necessarily often see uh, in uh, maybe Western aid approaches, sometimes perhaps, but there is more of a debate on that. Uh, there is also a certain, uh, if not preference, but uh, penchant for gradualism, gradual change uh, when it comes to transition reforms in transition countries. Again, this is not something that all of Japanese development practitioners have had, but some of them have definitely expressed uh, you know, suggestions that that could be the right way for some of the Central Asian republics. Um, I've already mentioned the absence of political conditionality. If you look at the scholarship on Japan's um, development cooperation, uh, you can see sort of three uh, large focuses uh, historically, geographically, Asia, Asian countries would be the main geographic focus. Sectorally, a lot of Japanese aid uh, or development cooperation goes towards infrastructure, has been uh, the case since uh, pretty much the postal period, in the postal period. And uh, if we look at this uh, the trifecta of uh, loans, grants, and technical cooperation, loan aid it has a quite large share, well, historically has had a large share in Japan's development cooperation. But this is not to say that grants uh, aren't important or technical cooperation isn't important. And this is where I would like to uh, give an example about Central Asia. Um, there was a figure published uh, a few years ago by I think the um, Foreign Minister Kishida that between 1992, I'll read it out, and 2017, uh, Japan dispatched about uh, two and a half thousand specialists to the region, uh, so experts, consultants, and so on, and has trained uh, under uh, 10,000 interns from Central Asia in various fields, uh, many of whom uh, Currently, they uh, went on to have some government offices up to ministerial and vice ministerial levels. 
Now, uh, one bit that I'd like to also focus on is this question of infrastructure. Infrastructure has become quite a buzzword uh, in the past 10 years. In economics, it was often you know, important, but somehow this whole politicization and weaponizing infrastructure has you know, come on into the debates in the past decade or so. And what's interesting to see is that if uh, you dig up some of the uh, uh, older JICA documents from around 2004, as this report that I'm about to quote is, it interestingly links, in my view, interestingly, uh, infrastructure and the idea of the Silk Road, which is probably quite self-evident, uh, especially for the uh, researcher community, the epistemic community dealing with Silk Road in Central Asia. But I think it's interesting that uh, an aid agency, an aid implementation agency in Japan uh, in 2004, uh, like to sort of quote that uh, example uh, in its in its uh, where in its rhetoric in its uh, policy wording. Uh, in a report which was about uh, transport infrastructure, uh, but also in general, it was a report that uh, emphasized how infrastructure is uh, important as physical assets, roads, rails, ports, airports, uh, you name it, but also how, uh, and this is the case for Japanese development cooperation, what's important in infrastructure are, is also uh, legal systems and uh, administrative infrastructure systems. So uh, that could be, for instance, something referring to the operation of physical assets, uh, or perhaps uh, you know helping with some legal assistance and legal codes uh, to developing countries. So this is something which uh, comes kind of early on, and uh, in my view also informs the relationship with Central Asia. Now this report that I'm citing here was not specifically on Central Asia. This was a general report by JICO on infrastructure, but just as an example, uh, it gives this sort of uh, interesting two ideas. I'll link it with the Silk Road and uh, emphasis on, on physical uh, and uh, non-physical assets as well. Now I will get to my monograph straight. <laughs> That's uh, a bit of a self-promotion, but because also this is the fruit uh, of some uh, years of work and uh, the book came out last year, I think it perhaps would be the best way to sort of uh, to use as a basis uh, in this presentation. In general, uh, the, the today's presentation uh, is largely based on that work, but also uh, based on some of the postdoctoral research I've been doing and some of the work that I've been doing at JICA Research Institute. So there is a, a number of um, things here. Of course, I am um, standing on the shoulders of the giants uh, and uh, a lot of uh, some of the stuff that I will be mentioning in, in that presentation uh, is in the extant uh, scholarship, uh, including authors, uh, some of whom have presented, I think, uh, on previous occasions uh, in this format. Now, the point that I'd like to make here as a resume of my book is that, well, it's a study of Japan's involvement in post-Soviet Central Asian countries. I deliberately choose this sort of vague term involvement because I'd like to go beyond strictly formal diplomacy. Diplomacy and official diplomacy is important, but I also uh, believe that it's equally important to see uh, the diplomatic impact made on that sort of New Silk Road uh, idea of Japan by various Japanese actors beyond formal diplomacy. And so in IR, it is a way to address this problem of anthropomorphizing a state, looking at a state as a monolith, while it is important to see, important to see different policy constituencies. In Japan's case, you often look at, when it, like when it comes to development cooperation or foreign policy in general, there are a number of ministries that are identified as uh, particularly important. Of course, it's the foreign ministry, but also you have the Ministry of Finance, and also Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry. Uh, then a number of other agencies as well, but I highlight those three uh, for the purpose of this relationship because economy plays such a large role in it. So the lens that I've been looking, uh, that I've been using to look at the relationship uh, and you know, to draw on debates about Japanese foreign policy, since after all, this is a case study of Japanese foreign policy. And so the literature on Japanese foreign policy would often emphasize how Japanese foreign policy is reactive. So I tried to see if, you know, where it was proactive, where it was reactive when it comes to Central Asia. Um, then some of the excellent scholarship, uh, for instance, I think that I say he uh, worked a lot on uh, talking about idealism and pragmatism in Japan's approach towards Central Asia. So I tried to also look at that and realism. And I've also added the, well, what I highlight here is developmentalism, this sort of idea uh, that, you know, developmental experience that Japan has had itself uh, as part of its modernization and as a post-war development as well, how that informs Japan's development cooperation. 
And of course, I try to keep in mind the sort of neo-mercantile considerations, the economic considerations, geo-economic considerations uh, that are important for Japanese actors in, 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 uh, that are economic, uh, such as respective ministries and companies. Uh, conceptually, I uh, here is where I'm really afraid of Montu, but I'm borrowing a physical term from physics. Uh, <laughs> there is this uh, idea of oscillation. Well, you know what oscillation is. Uh, and I say that uh, Japan's policy evolved from oscillating or you know, something that sort of oscillates, like uh, this is oscillating, to damping. So something which in Russian is So uh, oscillation that gradually becomes more firm and stable and actually ceases to be oscillating. In other words, I think that Japan's policy went from a more sort of oscillating policy course to a firm, more clear policy course with uh, uh, you know, a, a more clear cut sort of perspective, uh, how to engage with the region, uh, you know, for different periods of time. I also say that, uh, in my view, uh, Japan's impact on Central Asia and its connectivity has been a little bit underappreciated in, uh, in the current scholarship. And uh, Japan's infrastructural footprint in the New Silk Road region uh, predated China's Belt and Road Initiative. Again, I don't mean here to say, well, that something is better or something is older. It's more the idea that BRI is like the major milestone for connectivity uh, in Asia and in Central Asia. Uh, but it's important to see how this idea is of linking East Asia and Central Asia, including China at some points, where these are ideas that were also present uh, in Japan's thinking. Not all of them materialized. Some of that remained conceptual. Uh, but nonetheless, this is something uh, in my view that is uh, noteworthy. Um, I also argue here that the financial and policy contribution, including indirect one made by Japanese officials was in my view of sizable scale or the order of magnitude, at least comparable to the sort of early stage BRI in terms of uh, disbursement. And uh, I also say, well, something that has been said before, but you know, just to reiterate uh, that Japan was the first major power outside of uh, the sort of central Eurasia region to articulate a dedicated Silk Road diplomacy vis-a-vis -vis the region and the first to sponsor, to underpin that diplomacy with some material assistance. So this is just the chapter structure in general. It's a uh, fivefold. First, I talk about diplomacy, its different drivers, uh, the role of resources and uh, humanitarianism. Uh, then I try to look at the party dimension because uh, in the period that I'm looking at, there was a period when uh, there was a change of government in Japan. And so currently uh, in Japan, the government is formed by the coalition of the Liber Liberal Democratic Party and Komeito Party. But in 2009, 2012, uh, the Democratic Party of Japan, a different party was in power. So I try to sort of compare if there was continuity, uh, some inertia perhaps, uh, and, and change as well, what was different. I also look at, uh, well, Japan's aid more specifically and different drivers, as I've explained. Then I, uh, in chapter four, I proceed to uh, the question of uh, natural resources. How important are Central Asian resources in Japan and what sort of importance is that? Is this direct or is, is this some sort of commercial project? Is this more driven uh, by, by, by government policy and so on? And what I try to look here is the sort of anticipating and adaptive behavior. Uh, so again, going back to the question of Japan's foreign policy as reactive. Was Japan adjusting to changing external environment, such as the commodity super cycle, for instance, or was it perhaps anticipated? And I think it's, it's a bit of both. And then in the final chapter, I try to sort of look at the wider question of uh, not only Central Asian, but also Asian connectivity and what sort of roles Japan and China has had in that field. Of course, there is a, a degree of competition, which is something that you see in the media quite a lot, but also there was, uh, I think, an element of cooperation or at least engagement. And uh, what that portends for, uh, you know, this um, alarmist trend of weaponization of infrastructure finance, as uh, outlined sometimes uh, by the pundits. Um, project, sorry, how much time do I have left? Just to know. Uh, sorry, you, you have half an hour, don't worry. Oh, great. How good. Okay. <laughs> well, let's read some fine print then. So uh, yeah, just basically to explain what is it that I'm uh, talking more specifically, I try to look at the diplomatic history of Japan's foreign policy in Central Asia and look at the critical junctures, because you have a period uh, roughly before 9-11, and uh, that is sort of one type of relationship. 
And then after 9-11, Afghanistan becomes a key, big, important story that affects not only uh, uh, the way Japanese government sees the situation. It was Prime Minister Koizumi at the time, who also actually came to power just before 9-11 in April 2001, I think. Uh, but also it affects the way uh, that J Japan foreign aid uh, has been operating towards the region, because again, Afghanistan and the whole securitization of Afghanistan becomes uh, a policy story. And that's something that I consider in, in, uh, in my first chapter. Uh, as I mentioned already before, uh, more specifically, when I look at the governments formed by the Democratic Party of Japan in 2009, 2012, I try to see what was different from the Liberal Democratic Party, well, more specifically, in a nutshell, uh, there was a more pragmatic uh, position towards China, uh, because towards the end of the LDP administrations, maybe around the um, ASO premiership in 2008, 2009, uh, Japan's stance, stance on China was considered, you know, fairly conservative. And then that's what the Democratic Party of Japan tries to change. And uh, that is reflected in sort of wider policy that the, the DPJ had towards Eurasia. Um, and also I try to see the factional element, like what sort of factions both within the LDP and within the DPJ, how do factions matter, if, if at all. Then in chapter three, I argue that Japanese aid became a key factor in shaping the overall relationship, had some consequences be beyond it, and went through the stages of euphoria and uh, maybe also fatigue later on. And the 2010s were probably, I would call it stabilization. I guess, with, uh, you know, uh, sort of reasonable expectations and less, uh, less of a romantic connotation. But I think what's uh, interesting in terms of aid is that not only uh, the Japanese government provided um, physical monies, uh, in financial uh, loans or grants uh, or training, but also some Japanese officials provided policy and reform advice on reforms. Uh, and also, uh, I think, uh, for instance, with the establishment of the Uzbek Banking and Financial Academy, I might be getting the name wrong of the institution, uh, but I think that's where you had a number of Japanese officials being instrumental in, in developing the institution. So that is what in some Japanese publications is referred to as uh, intellectual aid, Chiteki uh, Shien. Again, uh, the, there is, uh, it's important that aid from Japan came roughly Pretty much 99% without political strings attached, or at least as compared to, say, the type of aid that you'd be looking at uh, from North America or, or Western Europe. However, in that sense, uh, starting in uh, the 2000s and later on, as you had different donors emerging, uh, some of them being uh, in OECD, like South Korea, some of them not being in OECD as a donor, at that, uh, such as China, that's where Japan's position in that field has become a bit more contested and uh, uh, there is some maybe more competition potentially uh, between donors. So uh, when, then I'd like to uh, talk a little bit about the chapter four, just to, to summarize my message there. Um, so I think that in extant, lit in extant literature, uh, the strategic importance of Central Asian resources for Japan uh, was a bit exaggerated. And I think so was Japan's competition for them with other powers. Even though, of course, there were elements of uh, commercial sort of competition for these resources, uh, but also it's important to remember that uh, at some points, Japanese officials and companies considered and proposed cooperation with uh, Chinese and Korean counterparts. So, for instance, uh, in one of the articles published in a um, publication by JETRO, Japanese External Trade Organization, uh, there was this idea of uh, Nikkamerenke, uh, which is Japanese-Korean uh, kind of collaboration cooperation floated around uh, 2010. Uh, now the relations between Japan and Korea, you, know, you might know that they're sort of uh, at their low uh, for reasons completely different from Central Asia, but that's why it's interesting to see this sort of contrast that uh, I'm not sure if much of that Nikanenike idea materialized, but it was published and articulated and formally uh, suggested. And I also say that Japan Inc., that is the corporate Japan, showed, showed both anticipation and adaptation in its uh, Central Asian businesses when it comes to commodity cycles. Now, finally, uh, in chapter five, I was try, sort of speaking to the discourse on Belt and Road, uh, which is a discourse which is increasingly hard to follow uh, because of the sheer uh, volume of it produced on. 
But uh, whenever it came to Japan, it often uh, Japan's, Japan's position vis-a-vis -vis Belt and Road was mostly, in my view, reductively interpreted as a pure reaction to Belt and Road, which is, of course, partially true. But also, uh, it's important to acknowledge that Japan also had some infrastructural and connectivity projects uh, existing in the region before Belt and Road. Uh, even perhaps in a different form, in a different shape, it, it was you know, different in nature. Uh, but they were visible. And so I thought that's something that is uh, important to, um, to, to articulate. So Japan has the history of regional initiatives, uh, some of them just before the BRI. Now, some of them, of them did not materialize. I'll show later specifically uh, which ones. But yeah, the dynamics here, as I mentioned, between China and Japan, uh, the competition is what's talked about most often. There was a degree of uh, cooperation, at least considered. Some of it may be uh, materialized as well, uh, especially in early periods, I guess the 1990s and early 2000s. And also depending on what we look at as um, cooperation. Um, and uh, I think it's also important to emphasize this so that when we go at the subnational sub -national level of uh, interpreting a foreign policy, and uh, that it, depending on the perspective of the ministry that you look at, for instance, Ministry of Foreign Affairs might have one perspective, but Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Economy might have a different perspective. And that is something that, uh, you know, has been uh, sometimes has uh, uh, has has transpired uh, that uh, in Japan, certain ministries sometimes would have a more cooperative stance uh, or at least less risk averse stance vis-a-vis -vis, uh, China's structural initiatives than uh, say the foreign ministry or other ministries. Now, again, this also depends on individuals and uh, uh, a lot of the data is real time. Uh, some of that comes through Japanese media. So it could be also interpreted as sort of signaling. So in that sense, uh, it's important to take that with a grain of salt, uh, but uh, I'm trying to sort of uh, show different, uh, different aspects of, of that story. So uh, now more specifically, if we can uh, move chronologically, I'll uh, suggest some relationship milestones. Uh, a lot of that has been covered by excellent literature, uh, but just to uh, show some highlights, uh, next year will mark the um, 30th anniversary of establishing diplomatic relations between Japan and Central Asia, as probably was the case also between many other countries in Central Asia by virtue of the uh, uh, independence of the USSR. Uh, there was an interesting, uh, again, uh, well-studied, I think, uh, prospect that didn't really materialize, uh, the Energy Silk Road gas pipeline that uh, a Japanese company, a Chinese company, and uh, an American company by its Chinese operations, Exxon by Exxon China, um, they considered this idea of a so-called Energy Silk Road, Silk Route gas pipeline uh, from Turkmenistan via Kazakhstan via Tarim Basin uh, to the Chinese East Coast, and then ultimately <clears throat> to Japan and South Korea. Now that didn't quite work out, but I think it is also important to see how you have Japan, China, and uh, the United States, a combination of countries uh, that are considering a joint project in infrastructure, in energy infrastructure. And that is something that perhaps is a bit harder to imagine these days, uh, but this is something that uh, in Central Asia maybe could have happened were it not for especially the feasibility conditions, which were particularly hard, as I understand. But also, I think there was, of course, discussions of some political sensitivity as well already at the time. Um, another important uh, juncture is uh, in the early 90s when what happens is that uh, Central Asian countries uh, benefit ultimately from uh, aid uh, from two regional multilateral development banks, such as the European Bank for Construction and Development and the Asian Development Bank. And uh, partly, at least, uh, this was facilitated by uh, some Japanese officials. And later, uh, Japanese officials at the EBRD kind of informally uh, supervised or, or covered Central Asian operations of the bank. Now, in 1997, a well-known milestone is that uh, Prime Minister Hashimoto Ryutaro uh, announced uh, the Eurasian diplomacy from the Pacific, which was sort of a response to what the Japanese government at the time saw as the Eurasian diplomacy from the Atlantic. So the Eurasian diplomacy of uh, uh, Western European and North American countries. And so Hashimoto and others had the idea that Japan also had to 
articulate a sort of comprehensive vision. And interestingly, that Eurasian diplomacy, while they use the term Silk Road countries, Central Asia plus Caucasus, uh, it also is a concept that covered Russia and China. So it was not a concept exclusively for Central Asia. And it was sort of seeing those three countries as a whole. And perhaps Russia was one of the main emphasis there. Uh, in the following year, Prime Minister Obuchitizo announced the Silk Road Action Plan uh, that already uh, uh, had the idea of uh, helping upgrade and modernization and the construction of transport infrastructure in the region, but also uh, uh, covered uh, democratic and economic reforms and uh, mineral resources. Moving on to the next decade, uh, well, I've already mentioned the 9-11 was a major milestone, making Afghanistan part of the sort of bigger regional picture. And this is when Japan commits uh, an important uh, aid package to Afghanistan. Uh, but also, this is when uh, the commodity super cycle gradually uh, rolls on and when prices go up, oil and gas, but also uh, minerals and metals. You can look at different graphs. And uh, this is when I think there was, a, if I'm, 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 I think it was called the Energy Silk Road Mission from Japan to Central Asia. Um, and uh, may, maybe the, this, this naming is not 100% exact, but roughly in general, that was the idea. In 2004, Foreign Minister Kawaguchi Yoriko introduced a framework called Central Asia plus Japan, basically five countries plus one. Uh, it was inspired by Japan's multilateral frameworks with Southeast Asia. Uh, Southeast Asia, as you know, is a sort of a priority subregion of Asia for Japan. But uh, we, we see that sort of uh, reproduction of that format in the case of Central Asia. And what's interesting is that recently some countries have been replicating that framework, uh, such as the United States, which has a C5 plus one, I believe. I think uh, Russia also has now its own framework uh, in a five plus one uh, format and so on. Well, you know, again, it might be something which is sort of on the top of the head, uh, makes sense. There is this region of five countries, and then there is a country engaging uh, bilaterally, but also this multilateral format. Well, uh, in Japan, this emerged in 2004 and has been continuing uh, ever since. Uh, with ups and downs, highs and lows, but the framework exists. So this sort of institutional design uh, is, is one of the legacies from that era. In, 2000, in 2006, uh, uh, an interesting concept is articulated by um, Foreign Minister Aso, who later became uh, Prime Minister, and uh, currently I think he's Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister. Um, there was this concept of arc of freedom and prosperity. Um, or, and Central Asia was a part of um, that concept. It's a concept that was announced, but didn't really take off because there was a uh, change of governments, change of policies and so on. It was uh, something that was uh, driven by um, value oriented diplomacy. However, in China, I think this concept was perceived as an attempt at encircling China or, or surrounding it somehow. So this in IR, this would be viewed as a sort of balancing concept, perhaps, uh, or maybe even containing uh, China, depending on how you interpret it. Uh, and then after that, there was this idea of transforming Central Asia into a corridor of peace and stability. So you see that sort of um, securitization rhetoric transpiring in that concept, especially if you consult Aslo's book, because I think he uses the metaphor uh, for unstable countries, this sort of arc of instability uh, that he wants to turn into the arc of freedom and prosperity. And he, I think, addresses some countries in Eurasia as magma or lava. So the idea is that, you know, it might start similarly a bit to Brzezinski's idea how uh, Central Asia is Eurasian Balkans or something. So the securitization rhetoric, as kind of you remember it from the uh, early, from the first half of the 2000s, was also present um, in that concept. But uh, as I say already, I don't think it has really taken off. And I think it was always accompanied by pragmatism. Uh, pragmatism, which was quite clear cut. that had to do with uh, um, resources, interests in Central Asia, but also at the same time, a pragmatism that was part of Japan's kind of hedging policy towards China, uh, which included elements of balancing, but also elements of engaging. For those of you who are not from IR background, I'm sorry, <laughs> there is this uh, sort of, uh, terms that uh, international relations uh, scholars love to use, engagement, balancing, hedging. Uh, they, 
sometimes can be vague, but basically, yeah, the idea is that um, you've had a bit of both there. And for instance, if you look at Prime Minister Aso, who was, uh, sorry, Prime Minister Abe, who was Prime Minister in 2006, 2007, uh, and also has been the Prime Minister since 2012 until last year. Uh, in the media, he's often portrayed as a sort of hawkish on China, but also what's important to bear in mind is that his uh, policies included several detente with China. So they also include an element of engagement. And that's something that kind of comes up less in the media. Uh, but I think, uh, although he uh, was behind, without, without the people behind this idea of value-oriented diplomacy, including vis-a-vis -vis Central Asia, there was always an element of pragmatism there. Right, uh, uh, moving on, uh, in 2007, there was an important mission by the head of Japanese Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry, Amari who visited Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan with the emphasis on uranium and rare earths. And I'm highlighting here a, a point in 2009, uh, which is when already Prime Minister Asotaro proposed the concept of Eurasian crossroads, development of uh, corridors, uh, meridional and latitudinal in Eurasia with focus on ports, rails, and road infrastructure, and also using Japan's technology, technologies. Now, this is, again, a concept that didn't quite materialize. He announced it, and in the same year, there was a landslide election uh, towards the end of the year, I think in August or September, which is when the other, power, the other party came to power. But what I'd like to highlight here is this sort of logic of corridors that would be transnational and also going you know, uh, different directions there. This is something that you can see in the Asian Development Bank's uh, thinking towards Central uh, Asia, as I'll show a bit later. Uh, but here, this was something that was uh, voiced at uh, sort of on the bilateral level. And I think even, even as a rhetorical pronouncement, this is something that is uh, worth uh, noting. Then DPJ uh, came to power, uh, and uh, there was a bit of a shift uh, in, in the policy orientation from this mix of pragmatism and value-oriented diplomacy to a more clear-cut pragmatism vis-a-vis -vis Central Asia and a sort of business-as-usual approach. Uh, so uh, very, the, the DPJ tried to uh, improve relations with China uh, and Korea, and as part of that, it uh, took down the concept of uh, uh, arc of freedom and prosperity, even though the concept itself was sort of uh, didn't have a particularly high materialization, as already mentioned. Finally, in 2013, following another landslide, the reverse landslide election in 2012, uh, Prime Minister Abe came to power, he quite revived the relationship, although mostly focusing on economic aspects, and uh, uh, became the second ever Japanese prime minister to travel to Central Asia. He was also the first prime minister to visit all, to visit all five states. This is something that you can compare in terms of dynamics of visits with, for instance, um, Chinese or Korean leaders or Russian leaders who travel much more frequently uh, to Central Asia. In Japan's case, the top leaders were as well. So far, that was uh, uh, Koizumi and Abe. And uh, Abe's rhetoric included uh, those value elements of free and open regionalism, free and open development, but also uh, pragmatism, something that I would like to highlight, was an important uh, part of the approach. And uh, Abe's approach, or the Abe administration's approach, was what they called top sales. So the idea is that you need very senior officials or politicians to promote uh, the exports of uh, Japanese uh, technology or, or, or products or, or infrastructure. And uh, Japan, uh, Japan at that time uh, momentarily regained the state of the status of Uzbekistan's top ODA donor, something that is, has had in the past, but then has intermittently lost. And it also stepped up some projects in Turkmenistan. And I think both in Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan, which were the two highlights of others' uh, visit in 2015, in terms of value of deals announced or, or closed, uh, the particular focus was energy, uh, power generation, and various sort of technologies for that. Now, here's a picture from uh, uh, showing the Japan's ODA to Central Asia, just to sort of show you some dynamics of that. The, uh, well, the blue bar is Kazakhstan, the green bar is Uzbekistan, and you see, and the red bar is Kyrgyzstan. So you see how in the 90s, uh, Kyrgyzstan is sort of quite stable and actually remains uh, stable pretty much um, throughout uh, this whole time. Uh, and uh, gradually then Uzbekistan and uh, Kazakhstan come into the picture. 
And then you have a bit of a sort of slowdown here. Uh, but as Abe comes to power around this time, you have an increase in ODA disbursements, especially towards Uzbekistan. So that's something uh, that is, uh, you know, quite a market trend here. Um, what's interesting here is that uh, Japan as a donor uh, operated, of course, in a, you know, not in vacuum. It operated in a specific donor landscape, which was uh, changing. I'm trying to uh, draw a very rough picture, a very schematic picture uh, of the donor landscape for Central Asia. And I think this is an environment that has been affecting uh, Japanese foreign policy. So if you look at uh, the, the text uh, below the table, and I roughly split it into three decades, where you have Central Asia going to the early nation building stage in the 1990s, uh, and of course, uh, experiencing a lot of uh, financial issues, uh, and also you have low commodity prices. And this is when the donors, uh, the donor structure is mostly uh, dominated by the United States, the EU, and Japan. Again, with the difference that Japan's aid is uh, uh, not politically conditional. Um, but then in the 2000s, a lot of that sort of structural environment changes uh, because you have on the one hand the commodity boom, providing uh, you know, a higher income for those countries that are well endowed in mineral resources, which is pretty much all of Central Asia, but you know, depending on sort of the resources that they have, uh, this is the dynamics that you know, benefits their finances. And then you also have at the same time, uh, the rise of emerging Asian donors, well, Turkey has been helping Central Asia uh, and been involved even before that, uh, but also it rises, uh, it raises its profile as a donor. China and Korea step up their game, one might say, and uh, uh, that improves uh, uh, Central Asian bargaining position as a recipient. And then uh, in the 2010s, uh, this is uh, something else uh, because the what the super super cycle gradually ends. Uh, or at least slows down, uh, especially in the second half of the 2010s. And uh, that then uh, at the same time, you also have the uh, increased stepped up activity uh, by uh, China as a donor, both bilaterally by its development banks, but also you have the rise of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, the AIIB. And uh, that again changes the donor landscape in which uh, Central Asia is located and where Japan is operating in. And so the um, table here just sort of recaps uh, the membership that uh, Central Asian countries have in various multilateral development banks. I'm not quoting uh, institutions such as uh, the Silk Road Fund here or others, uh, which are perhaps more bilateral, but here you have the sort of multilateral development institutions, including the Eurasian Development Bank. And so in other words, Central Asia has been gradually diversifying its access to development finance uh, from different donors is the point that I'm making here. Um, I would also like to briefly touch upon the role of individuals, as I think it is important. So we're not talking only about structure, we're also talking about agency and agency coming from uh, specific uh, individuals. Uh, Chino Tado is perhaps one of the prominent or one of the most prominent examples here. I don't mean to say that he has done everything, but he is just uh, a very uh, illustrious, right example of, of that sort of picture. Um, so uh, this is someone who has had a senior career in Japanese government. He has uh, assumed the post of the Vice Minister of Finance for International Affairs in 1991, which is a very senior position in the Japanese Finance Ministry, uh, a key post for Japan's international finance, informally known as Mr. Yen sometimes, I think. But also, if you look at the past um, careers of the presidents of the Asian Development Bank, many of them or all of them would have passed through that uh, position, as was the case for uh, Mr. Chino. But also he uh, happened to lay the groundwork for Japan's presence in Central Asia. He has had good personal relations with uh, some Central Asian leaders, such as uh, uh, the late president Islam Karimov, the former president of Uzbekistan, of course, the former president of uh, Kyrgyzstan, Askarakaev, and uh, with other uh, uh, politicians and uh, uh, statesmen there. Chino uh, encouraged gradualism as opposed to shock therapy in, in market transition in Central Asia. And uh, he was in that sense, uh, I'm not saying that all of Japanese officials were pro-gradualism. Uh, you know, some of them argued that perhaps uh, maybe, you know, big bang and shock therapy could be an option. But this is something that Chino has advocated himself, especially in Uzbekistan, I believe. 
Uh, and then, uh, well, coincidence, uh, I guess, but still something that uh, was maybe a lucky coincidence for Central Asia is that he has become the president of the Asian Development Bank. So someone uh, of that high stature and knowledge of Central Asia went on to become uh, the ADB president in 1999 and 2005. So he has had two terms, I think two, three year terms, if I'm doing it right. Um, and uh, he was also an advocate of a sort of special particular approach to Asian development, not only in Central Asia, but um, Asia in general, whether it comes to Afghanistan or other countries, uh, saying that Asia is not like Europe, and he stressed how diverse Asia is. But more specifically, uh, where Chino's role uh, is particularly high when it comes to Central Asia, according to some uh, interviewees, uh, he was viewed as a sort of well, there was this project called uh, CAREC, Central Asia Regional Economic Corporation, which is a program of sub-regional uh, trade facilitation uh, and also connectivity of the ADB. And according to some sources, it would, could be considered as Chino's brainchild. Again, uh, of course, uh, because we're dealing here with the ADB, which is a multilateral and international organization, you always have a number of different people, both Japanese and non-Japanese involved in devising something as large as CAREC. But uh, when we look at this sort of uh, Japan side of the picture, uh, it's certainly worth pointing out uh, Chino's role in uh, helping uh, Karik to, um, to steadily develop. I don't think he was in the ADB when Karik has just started. I think he came on a bit later because Karik started around 97, 98. Uh, but it was under his term that Karik has really institutionalized and uh, materialized. But if someone on this uh, um, at this lecture is from the ADB, I would welcome uh, all sort of uh, criticism and feedback uh, if I'm doing that bit uh, somewhat, uh, if I'm not doing justice. Another project that was not straight uh, ADB's project, but this is something, a uh, project which uh, Chino as uh, an ADB president has supported uh, was the TAPI pipeline, Afghanistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, a pipeline which is not, uh, we can call it partially materialized, not really materialized, but it's a project that has been uh, discussed a lot uh, at, at, various, uh, at, at various stages. And at some point, I think in the early 2000s, uh, Chino has supported the idea of, uh, of ADB backing the pipeline with some funding. Although later, I think that position has been reversed around maybe early 2010s, maybe by the mid 2010s. Uh, but also when we look at the sort of informal network, of uh, like policy constituency or just the constituency of professionals in Japan, Japanese professionals in the Ministry of Finance who have had knowledge of Central Asia and had dealt with it. Well, Chino Tando was a sort of key call in that one. And the bit that I would like to also highlight here is that it was under Chino that you've had this trend of, uh, that is now common practice, that Chinese officials are being appointed as ADB vice presidents. Because I think if you look at the ADB uh, structure until oh, 2001, I believe, or 2000, around that time, the you usually would have maybe a South Korean vice president or vice president from somewhere else. But under Chino, uh, you have, uh, I'm not saying again, I'm not crediting him individually, uniquely with that sort of policy, but it was under his presidency uh, that uh, Chinese officials started being appointed as vice presidents and also covering operations of the ADB in Central Asia but also in South and West Asia. So the first such vice president was Jin Lichun, which currently is the incumbent president of the AIIB, uh, Asian Contract Investment Bank. And uh, then he was followed by Zhao Xiaoyu, uh, Zhang Wentai, and Chen uh, Shixin. Uh, so this is, I think, it's important to see how uh, you have the you know, Chinese and Japanese, essentially finance ministry officials, uh, collaboratively interacting with an multilateral development banks such as the ADB vis-a-vis uh, -vis Central Asia. Nikolai, um, five minute wrap up. Okay, I'll just show some pretty pictures and <laughs> thank you. So yeah, this is uh, the picture of uh, the CAREC program, which is the Asian development banks, the ADB's uh, program for, uh, for uh, Central Asia. Uh, this is the map as of 2014. Uh, so you see this idea of corridors and uh, well, roughly the main uh, fields uh, where uh, CARIC is operating could be divided into transport, energy, and trade facilitation, maybe customs cooperation, removing different bottlenecks. 
But what I'd like to note here is the sort of different kind of corridors that you see, uh, both latitudinal and uh, meridional. Uh, this is uh, something that I'm quoting from the ADD website, just to give you the idea of the order of magnitude uh, since its inception in 2001. Uh, so in about 20 years, CARIC has mobilized 39.2 billion in investments that have helped establish um, multimodal transportation networks, increased energy trade and security, facilitated the movement of people and freight, and laid the groundwork for economic corridor development. So what I'm highlighting here is this sort of order of magnitude of uh, value in, in those investments. Now, again, it says that CARIC has mobilized, so it doesn't mean that it was individually invested by Japan. What I'm saying is that it's a program that Japanese officials played a key role in developing, uh, but of course, it's uh, the credit goes to the ADB here, um, which again, uh, as I mentioned, ADB is usually you know presided by a Japanese president, and Japan's uh, role as a voting power has been uh, crucial in, in the bank. Um, and again, there's logic of corridors, and this is something that uh, we might see, uh, for instance, in uh, an earlier program of the ADB called the Greater Mekong Subregion, uh, the GMS. Uh, so, Karak, as you see, you have, uh, well, now it has 11 countries, but it started with uh, some post-Soviet Central Asian countries. I believe uh, initially it was, I'm looking at this older report from 1998, you had Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and Uzbekistan, and uh, Xinjiang. So the idea of this uh, interregional cooperation. But then if you, you have a similar logic in the preceding initiative, uh, the GMS, which has had the six Southeast Asian countries of the Mekong region, plus uh, the Yunnan province and Guangxi Zhuang autonomous region uh, of China. So this is the pattern that I believe uh, ADB has used after uh, GMS in Karak as well. Um, well, since I don't have much time, <laughs> I'll probably just uh, mention one example of uh, uh, how Japan bilaterally and mostly via ADB has contributed to rail uh, development in Uzbekistan. So um, Japan's contribution here can be exemplified by uh, sections of high mountain railroad, Tashkent uh, Termes, in particular sections Marakat Tashkent, which are part of the uh, Kari Corridor 6. And the financing was provided by Japan Bank for International Corporation, JICA, and the ADB. Uh, also, there was an electricity support to that project, the electrification, I think, the power lines along the, uh, that was the Telemarjan power project aimed at uh, uh, powering the, the uh, railway, financed by Japan bilaterally and by the ADB. And on the company side, you had, uh, I believe, Mitsui at the time, that was, uh, uh, oh, sorry, I think I went to the slide. Uh, Mitsui, which used to be like a flagship of Japanese companies in Uzbekistan. Uh, perhaps since its Soviet era operations, uh, and also uh, a major operator of, uh, well, contractor rather, of uh, Japan's uh, ODA related projects. So this gives you maybe a good illustration of bilateral and multilateral levels of Japan support uh, to Central Asia in infrastructure. Um, with that in mind, I would like to thank uh, various organizations uh, and individuals for helping me on that road, and thank again the organizers of this talk. And uh, if there are any questions, I would be uh, delighted to answer them. Many thanks. Thank you, Nikolai. Um, do you want to stop sharing your screen so we can? Sure. Then... Okay. Uh, and we are open for questions and answers. We already have two questions in the chat. Um, uh, Iskander Abdullah, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, I mean, uh, if I may, thank you. For uh, Nicola, excellent presentation, and also thank you mentioning a lot of the time CARIC program. I'm representing partially being from CARIC Institute. We feel at uh, ADB that uh, CARIC has a special support from Japan. Now, you know, situation in Central Asia is changing, and you know, relations between China and Russia is changing. So my question is, what do you predict uh, future relationship between Russia and Japan on Central Asia? Will they still try to not try to avoid uh, some kind of disagreements while you think mm. it's hard to keep the balance. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Adlaev. Look, I think uh, you've had different periods of uh, Japan's uh, relations with Russia in Central Asia. And uh, mostly, 
I think they were pretty sort of, if not to say neutral, I don't think there was much of conflict in those relationships. So one high, one, one sort of exception uh, was this concept of arc of freedom and prosperity that I have mentioned in 2006, um, which didn't really materialize. It was announced. It was uh, hanging on the website of the foreign ministry in Japan for a few years. Uh, and I mentioned that in China it was viewed as a, a sort of encirclement. But I think also in Russia, I think Foreign Minister Lavrov at some point uh, voiced, uh, well, disagreement of sorts with that concept. But I'm saying this to mention that, that perhaps that was the only clear, really clear instance of some sort of competition between Japan and Russia in Central Asia. It was around 2006 uh, with the rise of the Shanghai Corporation Organization. But after that, gradually, it was an increasingly, uh, well, positive or non-conflictual relationship, in my view. And I think that's where it's heading uh, now. Uh, reasons for that may be quite different. Uh, you have elements of cooperation. I think uh, drug enforcement and uh, sort of drug security is something a bit pinpointed, smaller project, but that's something where uh, Japan and Russia cooperated. I think that was in Tajikistan, I believe. Uh, this is something that has been happening in the mid-2010s. And I think for Japan, uh, in its relations with China, uh, and also in general, China or not China, for Japan, perhaps the primary region in Asia is the Southeast Asia. So in that sense, uh, Central Asia is important for Japan, but uh, I'm not sure, uh, I personally am not expecting a major uh, competition or rivalry between Japan and Russia in that region in the future. I think Japan has other priorities. Nikolai, I should let you know, uh, sort of, uh, Dr. Dolaev is the deputy director of the Carrick Institute. Uh, so you can ask him some questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I, actually, I would love to, but that would be me abusing my position as speaker. <laughs> but I'd love to, actually. So thank you for your question, and I'm looking forward to maybe discussing in the future. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Maya, would you like to um, ask your question? Thank you. Thank you. Excellent talk. Really thoughtful and very informative. Um, I wondered if Fukuoka had any uh, information, any evidence on uh, the importance, uh, strategic importance and actual practical uh, um, flows of money into education, into higher education in Central Asia from Japan. So how mm. much do you think Japan prioritizes the development of higher education and research in Central Asia? What do you think? Thank you, Maya. This is an excellent question. Uh, I think uh, in general, education uh, for Japan is, is, is it, you know, an important priority of uh, its development cooperation. So when we say development cooperation, it covers all sort of different areas, uh, physical assets and, and whatnot, but human resources training and uh, personnel training is a very important part of it. In fact, I myself, I'm working with the JICA Research Institute. I'm on the team called Development Studies Program. Uh, and so uh, I guess I, I was able over that time that I've been working here to appreciate how much uh, of emphasis is placed on, on education uh, aid uh, in general, not only to Central Asia. Now, with quantifying right now, I might not do justice in terms of specific figures uh, of, of funds. Uh, I might look it up or, or perhaps suggest referring to specific documents. I'm happy to help with that. Uh, but I think what's it, maybe what might give some um, good, good, good illustration is that it's a very kind of multifaceted corporation. And to not, not to make it vague, what I mean by this is not just uh, disbursing monies or flows of certain things flowing towards projects or giving scholarships to people who you know, come, 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 are coming to, to Japan, but also you have sort of specialization in fields. Like I think Nagoya in the city in Japan is famous for having a program uh, focused on law. And this is where students from Uzbekistan and I think other Central Asian countries are uh, I have been coming regularly for uh, decades now to study law. And uh, you also have this uh, idea, I think it's part of Japan's grant to technical cooperation that Japan has been sponsoring, uh, uh, what are they called, uh, centers, JICA centers in Uzbekistan and in, in Kazakhstan. And many of these centers are actually quite centered on, well, sorry for the plan as for the tautology, but the centers are uh, focused on 
education and training programs. So you have one in Almaty, I think uh, definitely one in Tashkent. Uh, I think they're called like UJC, Uzbek Japan Center. They're usually under the aegis of JICA. And uh, uh, you would have library, training programs, and so on. So it's not only um, inbound scholars who are coming from Central Asia to Japan, but also there are uh, projects, uh, JICA and others that are established uh, standalone in Central Asia, as well as you have a cooperation with universities in Central Asia specifically. Um, I'm sure maybe some, uh, some specific individuals uh, may be you know, a, a good indication in that sense, like uh, Professor Shigeo Katsu, who I think is the president of Nazarbayev University, I believe. I think he's Japanese. Yes, right. he is. <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying that he is necessarily, you know, somehow uh, part of Japan's development cooperation, but I think the sort of selection and uh, I think the, 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 the appointment of him to that position uh, might indicate how Japan is, uh, you know, prioritizing that sort of... Um, Actually, uh, Nikola, I can give you some background on that a more direct one. So he comes from a different route altogether. Um, mm -hmm. He comes from the World Bank uh, regional right. uh, office. Um, and his deputy uh, um, in that bank was the minister, eventually the Minister of uh, edu Higher Education of Kazakhstan and also the first provost, uh, well not provost, but the second position is of Nazarbayev University who appointed him to, basically he brought his boss uh, into, the, <laughs> into the new job. Um, so Japan angle is a little bit uh, sort of peripheral to that specific case. Um, mm. uh, yeah. More of a financial uh, angle than if it's World Bank, right? Yeah, yeah, it's a World Bank angle, but uh, yeah. Uh, but I, I think it's, it's less to do with any of those uh, uh, angles. I think it's made the relationship between the two, two persons is a more important angle there. Okay, yeah, probably yeah, I'm yeah. using the, the wrong example here. Yeah. Uh, it just sort of comes to mind. But yeah, I just wanted to basically point out how Japan uh, doesn't only you know, provide specific flows of money, but also contributes to the establishment of centers. Training centers in Central Asia cooperates with universities. Uh, and of course, also keeps uh, receiving scholars uh, in Japan itself, sponsored uh, well by different organizations, including JICA. Uh, uh, just to add to what Nikolai said, there are also uh, very large technical um, uh, science STEM type uh, high education research centers. So you have a very big one in Turkmenistan, uh, several million, uh, several tens of millions, I would say. There's a one that's being built currently in uh, Uzbekistan. Uh, and they call Japan Center, whatever else, and then you have uh, similar um, things to like uh, everyone responds to, to Confucius Center or or that type of thing. So you have in in say for instance in Narcos in in Kazakhstan, uh, uh, Japan Center, and it, similar things in other universities. So you have a, quite a few uh, different channels through which that, that that's done. As you said, Nikolai, in the very beginning, that it's not just JICA. You have other ministries, particularly the industry one, and they 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 set up their own thing and and. The, the industry, academia, I like the, what's called the, the fashionable word, um, a triple helix <laughs> uh, thing with the nuclear remediation and, and other things in, again, both in Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. So there are several other, other sides of the story. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. It, it, it's hard to cover that because, yeah, it's... Which you is can't, yeah, you can't, it's the big, big, yeah. Okay. Okay, um, uh, Shadi, go ahead. Hi, thank you, Nikolai, for a, for a lovely talk. I certainly learned a lot over the past uh, hour. You mentioned uh, that a former prime minister made it clear that in, in his writings that economic development usually precedes uh, liberalization. And that's probably been taken into account with Japanese uh, foreign aid and international cooperation. But then you, when you were mentioning the trends, you said, you know, the euphoria of the 90s versus the fatigue of the 2000s. So are we seeing here like a convergence in the on the conditionalities imposed by uh, Japanese foreign aid, for instance, versus China? And if so, why do you think um, th there's been a slight change or uh, in, in the appetite? Um, sorry, the, the last bit, just to catch that, uh, you mean because the conditionality with China in what way? So in terms of how China is offering conditionalities now in terms of their loans or their aid packages, you know, you see, for instance, huge investment in Djibouti and uh, even in, in Central Asia where, you know, you don't really have many political conditionalities. So do you see a convergence with, uh, with Japanese condition, conditionalities vis-a-vis -vis, uh, China's? Right. Thank you. 
Uh, yeah, I have to uh, make sure that I point out that you know I'm speaking as a, a scholar uh, and you know reflecting my opinion. I'm not reflecting the opinion of JICA or any other <laughs> government organization of Japan. Uh, as you can tell, I'm not a uh, you know I'm not a, a government official of any uh, of any government for that matter, uh, Japan or not. Uh, so it's just you know my thoughts as a scholar. Uh, yeah, we'll see uh, when we look at the development aid. Uh, so there is this sort of. Um, uh, these stages that I've pointed out, euphoria and fatigue, and the uh, donor landscape changes as well with the rise of emerging donors. But what you also have at the same time is Japan's own relations with other donors. So Japan in the 80s uh, has, and before, but especially in the 80s, has been criticized by uh, North American and uh, Western European donors as being too pragmatic as being sort of self-serving uh, in that sense, because a lot of its aid was tied, a very large share of its aid was tied. So Japan started untying its, uh, well, not all of it, but a lot of its aid in uh, 1970s. This was before it started aiding Central Asia. Uh, and some of that untying benefited American companies. So not only Japanese companies, but then American companies started to participate. Uh, is that business generation for American companies? <laughs> you know, you can look at it this way, but that way as well, politically. So there are always these elements of uh, relations with the US and other powers that are in place. Um, and, uh, but then, yeah, this is, I think, around uh, late 80s, early 90s, Japan has been uh, taking, uh, I'm taking reforms of the ODA to sort of decrease that uh, untied element and to well show that there is pragmatism and you know, Japan's aid, the reason Japan invests in infrastructure in other countries is because well, that's the way Japan itself went through as a country that was developing. It has been investing in infrastructure and that's why you know, that was part of its success. So it's sort of uh, using itself as a case study. Uh, but still, there was, you know, that debate on Japan's aid as being Asia focused, loan focused rather than grant focused and uh, infrastructure focused and you know, being pragmatic, that debate still lingered. It still lingered and you know, has been around. And it's interesting to see how, well, in some way, Japan has been vindicated indirectly uh, as you see similar approaches uh, adopted by China, adopted by uh, South Korea, but perhaps in, well, I don't wanna say on steroids, but uh, you know, in, in, in a much more, and it's very straightforward pragmatism, right? Uh, in that sense, and then in the case of China, it's not uh, the, the, there isn't a uh, any pressure from the OECD DAC as it would be for for Japan for South Korea. Uh, so, of course, then the question for Japan is: uh, on the one hand, you know, there is this relations with, with Western donors; on the other hand, there is relations with developing countries as recipients, and that's that's Japan's policy equation in that sense. That uh, there's always, I think, there will be a bit of a dilemma. Uh, I think one, uh, if, if, if you're interested in uh, more details on that, it's interesting to see how Japan has been untying its aid and uh, sort of uh, organizing it uh, along some programs such as STEP. Uh, STEP is uh, special terms for equipment procurement. Anyway, it's an abbreviation STEP. And if you look it up, it basically it's a program for Japan's tied aid for infrastructure. And then if you look at specific terms, well, then that sort of uh, shows what sort of conditions there are. But also, I think on JICA website, uh, there are specific um, terms for loans, and you can look at the interest rate and so on. So if that depends on the uh, category of income that uh, the recipient is in. So if it's a country like Afghanistan, uh, you know, one of the uh, least developed countries, then the rate is, the conditions are, you know, very soft. It's a 40 year loan with a 10-year grace period and I think 0.01 interest rate. But then it gets more complicated as you go by different countries, different projects. So uh, JICA has it in the open. Uh, and uh, I don't have on top of, the top of my head information for like interest rate uh, and like grace periods and stuff for um, Chinese loans. But I think that's where it's interesting you know, to compare those specific figures. Uh, but yeah, the question is, of course, for Japan, you know, uh, should it become more pragmatic uh, in its aid? Uh, I, I think it's an open question, but also it wants to sort of lead a serve as an example, especially as Japan has been uh, emphasizing quality infrastructure uh, and, you know, been trying to uh, speed up its uh, procedures of um, approvals for loans and increase the number of approvals for loans. So I think that was a way in which Japan has been trying to sort of improve its own aid administration and implementation.
Does that do justice <laughs> to your question? Yes, it does. Thank you very much. I will look into that. Thank you. Thank okay. you, Nikolai. That was a very detailed answer. Um, Sorry. <laughs> that, that's okay. No, that was, that's exactly what we want. Um, uh, Mr. Resham Singh Sindhu, uh, Sandhu, would you like to ask your, uh, well, make your comment? Uh, it's... Uh, thank you very much, Professor. This is quite an excellent talk, quite informative as well. But only my concern is because when are we are talking about the Central Asian countries, there are a number of other countries. You have mentioned a number of countries who got the interest in the development or connectivity with the Central Asian countries, including Japan, South Korea, China, Russia, and to some extent, US but hardly any mention of India and Pakistan, because these are the countries which are very much interested in, in the Central Asian countries as well. As far as I am concerned about a new India in uh, Prime Minister Modi's uh, government, they do invest a lot of money in the Central Asian countries, but absolutely I don't understand that uh, is there any competition between China, Japan, India, US, to investing money in the Central Asian countries. And because they, they are the one, all these countries are looking at Central Asian countries, they're the source for the future, uh, oil and uh, platinum and all these resources. So that is why I think that a lot of countries are making their investment in, in the Central Asian. But what do you think Japan, India, Pakistan uh, relationship when they, they are, cooperating to invest money in the Central Asian countries. Thank you. This is uh, yeah, a very relevant question. Uh, and you know, it's quite some ground to cover. So I'll try to be sort of succinct there. I don't think, uh, just to rule it out, I don't think there is uh, necessarily a competition between Japan and India or Pakistan. I think Japan would be engaging with both of these countries at different stages and in different roles. Uh, I think if we look at, for instance, the ADB angle, if you look at the map of uh, CAREC as it was expanding from a Central Asian connectivity towards South Asia, I think this thinking of uh, linking Central Asia and South Asia, uh, that, that vision that you had promoted by the United States, that vision was also shared by Japan. So uh, in that sense, the ports of uh, Gwadar, Karachi, uh, I'm pronouncing them in my <laughs> Russian accent, so maybe, maybe you know, but, but basically the idea of connecting um, Central Asia with, well, Southern seas with the Indian Ocean uh, via those ports uh, was something that has been considered. And I think both uh, of those ports that I mentioned, uh, Pakistan I, are in, uh, on the Karak map. Uh, so that's as far as the ADB is concerned. At the same time, you also uh, uh, th there is also what has been recurrently mentioned was the southbound connection uh, of Central Asia via Iran. Uh, this was before the sanctions. Uh, Bandar Abbas has been mentioned by uh, the Japanese, as as you know, Japan uh, you know maintains maintains a fairly stable relationship with Iran, uh, and you know before the sanctions, uh, the, the, I think from I think. Uh, also, Taro, when he was foreign minister, he was talking about the possibility of helping to export Uzbek gold via Bandar Abbas. And then the sanctions kicked in in 2006 or around then. And uh, then, of course, you know, since Iran isn't in the ADB <laughs> as, you know, say, uh, Pakistan or, or others would be, this is another issue. But what has been happening recently is that. Uh, I believe uh, there has been some collaboration uh, between Japan and India for the port of Chabahar, uh, in, for the project of the port of Chabahar, I should say, uh, with Iran. Uh, I think India, of course, is the main player uh, in, in that respect, but I think there has been some uh, support from Japan, uh, but some of, I haven't been following the story very closely, so uh, I can't you know, give much specifics. I just know that in general, uh, I think you know, Japanese, uh, government figures, some officials uh, have uh, supported directly or indirectly or tacitly uh, the idea of India's connection with Central Asia via Chabahar. Uh, now then, the uh, 
how, how to put it, the, the looming question would be uh, China-Pakistan economic corridor. Uh, uh, this is something that I, I haven't uh, studied Japan's attitudes towards that specific uh, mega project, uh, the CPEC or CPEC. Um, but uh, again, I think if we look at the uh, ADB's uh, CARIC and uh, the role of uh, Pakistan there, uh, I think there is clearly uh, Japan's support towards that. Then you had, I think, this idea such as uh, CASA 1000, Central Asia, South Asia, the, the you know, electricity grid export, uh, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan to Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uh, and I think either ADB or, or Japan uh, had voiced, uh, you know, support uh, or provided support to this idea. So uh, I think Japan uh, is, uh, you know, rather supportive in that sense and not competing with um, either of the two big uh, major South Asian powers. And then, of course, there is, well, Sasek, which is a different separate story. The ADB has the uh, South Asian uh, Sub-Regional Economic Cooperation Program. Uh, but uh, I know that, again, some Japanese officials played a role in establishing it in the ADB. But again, this is ADB, multilateral, so uh, I can't, you know, point it all. I can't point the spot spotlight just to Japan. Um, well, that's what I have to say on that matter. I hope that's it's quite general, but uh, yeah. Thank you, Nikolai. Um, Olga Gulina, please, if you could unmute yourself. Hello, everyone. Um, Nikolai, thank you so much for your wonderful talk. I am so happy, <laughs> um, so especially I can uh, ask my question in Russian language because I was born in Russia as well. Uh, but nonetheless, it, it's <laughs> a pleasure uh, to hear your talk. Um, my field of study is migration studies, and I'm very keen and interested in what is going on with Central Asian nationals in uh, China, Japan, Korea, and etc. I have been in Central Asian countries and they uh, repeatedly tell me that they are very interesting to organize um, organized employment from Uzbekistan, from Tajikistan, to Japan, Korea, and etc. Can you tell or mm. have you heard about success of such program or at least are they in place? Uh, can you tell something uh, about uh, the, the, such initiatives? Thank you so much. Thank you for a question, Olga. Olga, unfortunately, this is you know beyond my expertise. So uh, I just you know wouldn't want to be doing guesswork there. Uh, I would expect probably Korea to have a sort of special place there because of the nature of uh, the human ties between South Korea and the Koryo Saram, the uh, Koreans of Central Asia. So I, I would expect South Korea, again, hypothetically, to have a more developed program in that sense than Japan. Japan does have dedicated uh, specialists and you know, skills, uh, skilled migrant programs. A lot of them are mostly directed uh, and I think, uh, well, targeting or involving um, countries such as the Philippines or Vietnam, um, I, I am unfortunately unaware of, uh, you know, the role that uh, Central Asian workers would be playing in those programs. I only have some anecdotal evidence. We have recently been looking for a nanny in Tokyo, and uh, most nannies who are Russian speaking, I think, are from Uzbekistan. Uh, but again, this is purely anecdotal, just from my personal experience. And uh, yeah, I, I wish I could do more justice to your question, but I just don't have the, uh, that, that sort of data. Thank you, Nikolai. Um, Alicia Campi, you're next. Thank you very much. I appreciate being uh, um, invited to participate in this and I very much enjoyed Nikolai's presentation. I myself am a Mongolist, um, tutored in the Northeast Asian tradition and trying now to become a much more educated Eurasianist. And so um, following up on a previous conversation and question um, today, I wanted to um, explore Nikolai's point of view on how much is Japan's interest in Central Asia and its resources a stimulant for today's 2021 rise in support by Japan for Eurasian connectivity concepts, such as the Asian energy supergrid and Northeast Asian transit corridors, rather than 
what I think were, were previous Japanese ideas to piggyback on existing connectivity structures. If there has been a change, why do you think that has come about? Many thanks. Yeah, look, this is a wonderful question. Uh, I uh, the, the question is for me how to link it to Central Asia because there is this separate subject of Japan and the Asian supergrid. I believe you're referring to this idea of electricity power grid in Northeast Asia, is that right? This sort of Korea, China, Japan, Russia uh, thing, is that right? Well, that's what- um, Yes, but the supergrid is beyond that. It is um, mm. also moves um, into certain Central Asian concepts and even all the way down to um, South Asia. Okay. So it's very uh, wide. And when I go to such meetings, Japan is always a very strong promoter of this mm. particular grid. Because I, I definitely looked at uh, Japan's or some of, again, this is where I try to highlight this idea of who in Japan specifically. Um, so for instance, when it comes to Northeast Asia, that bit, uh, you have uh, the Japanese company known as SoftBank, and its founder, um, Masayoshi Son, who is a uh, Japanese of Korean origin. And he is a very avid, well, uh, he's a, sorry, he's a very adamant promoter of uh, idea of uh, electricity uh, sort of circulation between, as I mentioned, the Northeast Asian states. Um, now with Central Asia, there, there was support for the CASA 1000 uh, idea. I unfortunately don't have uh, information about uh, the linkage between the two or, or the super grid. So uh, I'll probably refrain from a comment there. Um, and uh, with Northeast Asian transit corridors, uh, again, this is something that I think Japan is definitely looking at in different ways. Uh, well, for instance, uh, maybe not so much energy, but more transport. Japanese companies have been using the Eurasian land bridge that was the Trans-Siberian uh, in, the, in the 1980s, especially. So when uh, in, in the, in the post-Soviet era, when the, the state of Trans-Siberian's operations have deteriorated, uh, it was uh, quite a, you know, uh, unpleasant news for, for Japanese companies. But recently they have been resuming and increasing the usage of the Trans-Siberian. I think Toyo Trans is a Japanese company involved in that. And uh, I mean, Economic history as well here is quite relevant because Japanese companies actually have helped build coal terminals in Nahotka in Russia, and uh, they've actually been pretty actively involved in uh, Eurasian land bridge and Trans-Siberian since like 1970s, uh, maybe even before. And, and that's something that, that I think there was, has been a resumption in that trend in terms of transport in the past few years, especially that uh, in the 2017, in, uh, there has been an economic partnership agreement signed between the EU and Japan. And uh, I think there is, uh, you know, and on the, on the other hand, you also have an agreement, I think an F FTA signed between South Korea and the EU. And this is where I think that there is a chance for Trans-Siberian. But then the question is, of course, whether Trans-Siberian Russia would be a competitor to any routes to Central Asia or not. Uh, you know, somewhere parts of the Trans-Siberian are parts of the Belt and Road, or supposedly would be parts of the Belt and Road that would be the Western part of the Trans-Siberian. But if you look at the eastern part of Trans-Siberian, that's perhaps of more interest to Japan and South Korea. So in that sense, I think there is interest in Japan for that. And uh, there are, yeah, different, uh, I think there has been a program under the UN, uh, what's the commission called, ASCAP. Uh, the, as a Mongolist, you would surely know, uh, the Tumangan Initiative. Yes, the two, Tumen, the, yeah, yeah. The Tumen, Tumen River Initiative. Tumen River yeah, Tumen, Initiative. Yeah, Tumen River Initiative. So, uh, which is something that, you know, sort of this, you know, nice functionalist idea. Well, the membership of that has been sort of fluctuating with uh, countries coming in and out, uh, I think North Korea, but uh, yeah, I think that's also somewhere where Japan has been involved. Uh, but yeah, I think often you would probably, in my view, for Japan, Central Asia would be rather separate than Northeast Asia. Uh, I think uh, you have more more things that separate those two dossiers in Japanese foreign policy than those that link them, if that makes sense. Uh, so if you believe that, if you believe that, then how do you, how does Japan um, expect to get out resources? 
Is it sending the resources that will they would um, need in Japan further west to come by sea, or oh, if yeah. they're not going east? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Excellent point. Thank you. I think it also depends on the sort of period of time, which depending on the cost of resources, the production cost of resources, uh, and and the price of resources, uh, you know, one or the other way might become more uh, more convenient. So, um, of course, yeah, Central Asia is quite far for Japan. Japan is, of course, interested in diversifying its uh, structure of uh, resource suppliers. Uh, uh, the idea of energy on tons by Professor Ken Calder, I think, might come in picture here, whether you know, it would be an energy on tons with Russia or with uh, Central Asian states. Uh, so one example is, or perhaps that's more Caucasus than Central Asia, uh, Azerbaijan, where Japanese companies, uh, I think Itochu, and also Impex, uh, which is a company with the participation from the government, they've been invested in development of the Azeri Chirag Gunashli oil field in the Caspian, and also in the uh, BTC pipeline, Bakul Belisa Jehan pipeline. Uh, so um, I think some of that would be going through the pipeline, if I understand, but also they would be using swap mechanisms. So they would produce some oil in the Caspian, um, Azerbaijan, possibly also in Kazakhstan, and then swap that oil for oil uh, originating from Southeast Asia. Uh, I'm not sure if it's if it would be Indonesia or Malaysia, but swap mechanism is something that des definitely has been mentioned uh, for quite some time. I think it has been operational. That's if we look at uh, oil. Uh, then if it, if we look at uranium and other things, you know, it, it's it's a different sort of uh, mechanism uh, of uh, transport, of course, and different sort of quantities. But Japan has been also interested in rare earth metals and uranium uh, in Kazakhstan, for instance. Uh, but I guess your question was mostly referring to the hydrocarbons, if that if that's right. So initially, there was a lot of ambitious projects in the 1990s uh, in Turkmenistan and many other places. Well, Tapi pipelines, if we look at the Tapi pipeline, its very early version uh, included, I think, Itochu as well, the Japanese company. But then the developments in Afghanistan uh, made the pipeline, you know, very high risk, to say the least. Uh, but it, it, the pipeline has been mentioned by, for instance, the same uh, uh, former Foreign Minister Aso that I mentioned before. Uh, so yeah, that would probably. Uh, I, 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 gradually, I think the Japanese companies have abandoned the idea of uh, many pipelines. I think there was something more popular in the. Uh, 1990s, and then by the time BTC was completed in 2003, and especially by the time Russia's uh, Eastern Siberia Pacific Ocean ESPO pipeline has been complete, uh, well, this is when you know Japan uh, and and then other oil and gas projects with Russia, and maybe some of them upcoming, such as the Arctic LNG and uh, Far Eastern LNG in Russia. Since a lot of that is within you know proximity for Japan. That makes relatively Central Asian resources uh, less, uh, you know, perhaps less of a le less of a short-term interest, to put it that way. <laughs> I, I I'll add a little bit to what Nikolai said here, uh, especially regarding rare earths and, and uranium and and those things. Uh, uh, East Asian, particularly Japanese um, strategy, is very different from the Western one, meaning extra. It's not about extract and take away is more about developing uh, more value add locally um, and uh, this has been clearly seen with with especially with the nuclear fuel cells but uh, other way around and there's also an, another aspect to this thing which uh, already you hinted uh, Nikolai the price I mean obviously once you uh, process it rather than taking a lot of bulk out which is heavy and and, and adds cost before it, any value is added to it so you you kill that thing right there on the spot and then it's a smaller one uh, locally but then there's further strategy that how th th there is a there is a three-way kind of a crisscrossing of interest. So West generally doesn't want rare earths to come out into the, the usage in big way because they don't have it and they don't control it, so they don't want it out. Uh, so you create alternative technologies um, while um, Japan is kind of ambivalent about it. If it works, uh, uh, why not use it? Uh, then there's a China um, story of basically having the biggest infrastructure in developing that. And, and, and sort of perceived monopoly. I think it's a lot of political talk about it. It's not a real one. Uh, nevertheless, that is there and that plays a role in that can there be other providers uh, of equal quality and quantity. And Japan kind of a, 
uh, you know segues into that and it's part of a development strategy that how can Kazakhs benefit from their uranium more than say Japanese companies do naturally there, there, there are other aspects of the discourse that come in so it's, it's a much more complex story than simply extract and take away uh, and, and of course anybody who wants to extract and take away thinks mostly now of south the what you discussed Charbahar the the other ports and whatever else those connectivities where Japan again has a special place separate from the Western uh, players. Okay, thank you. Um, Nejat, uh, would you like to ask your question? Nazi, that's for you. Nazi. Yes, I know. I'm just <laughs> muting myself, unmuting. Um, well, first of all, thank you very much for uh, to the forum to keep us going during these hard times with really interesting and uh, very educational uh, seminars. Um, my question is basically a general one. It is not specific to this one because the role, as we know, the, the, the role of personal relations are important in commerce, in business, in, in everything, including the external aid. However, when it comes to external aid, um, it is ambiguous, at least for me, where uh, a, a line should be drawn because we don't know what exactly the content or the extent should be, to what extent they are transparent, to what extent they are justified. That goes, of course, uh, through all the levels. But as we are from time to time um, hearing about the scandals going back to personal relations for certain contracts, etc. And I think in, on an international arena, it becomes even more sensitive because politics and political decisions have a long-standing um, impact, particularly with, uh, when it comes to the leaders of some of the countries or regions in the world which have a high turnover or can not be viewed exactly as fully transparent, etc. So that's a general question about the ethics of external aid. And uh, as we heard today, I mean, there have been uh, quite strong uh, role played by personal relations in, in bringing in aid or uh, directing the aid. Uh, so that is a question I think to open to everyone. And, uh, and I'm glad that the country uh, Iran is being mentioned, although probably it is a long way away, but in particular, it, if it comes also to taking note and, and bringing back into the folds, there will be a lot of those questions involved in the future, I suppose, so. Thank you. Um, look, I, I guess I meant specifically, my, my, the reason why I mentioned the role of personalities is that it, it was one of those international relations scholars issues, you know, do we wanna look at the monolithic sort of black box state which makes decisions and conducts foreign policy or do we want to discern the roles of different individuals, their you know their opinions and so on, uh, in shaping a certain policy course. And uh, I thought that in, in my case study, Japan and Central Asia in the past uh, 25 years or so, some individuals definitely are uh, very important in terms of how they view uh, the region. Well, I mentioned Chino Tadao, but if, for instance, if you look at the uh, manifesto book uh, by uh, Shinzo Abe that he published in 2006, just before he went on to become prime minister for the first time. So it's a book uh, called Utsukushi Kunie, Towards a Beautiful Country. Um, he talks about all sort of different policy issues. It's a manifesto, you know, before sort of going, assuming a leadership position. But um, he mentioned Central Asia, uh, which is uh, in his foreign policy kind of uh, chapter, which is something that not necessarily every prime minister or future prime minister candidate would mention. And I thought the, the fact that Abe, uh, as an individual, the way he shaped with his visions, with you know, his uh, uh, priorities, the way he shaped the relationship was particularly important. But yeah, I was not hinting here at, uh, I guess, the anyhow, the ethical or unethical issues. Uh, of course, you know, in aid, you know, this is a debate that any aid program and Japan's program has always had, how to make aid, how to make sure the foreign aid addresses uh, the right categories of people 
you know, actually, you know, permeates, trickles down to, to the actual uh, target population rather than just staying somewhere up in, I don't know, in the institutions or, or ended up being pocketed by officials. And I think uh, in, if you look at the history of Japan's ODA in, around the same period of time, uh, there has been a number of reforms, uh, especially in the 2000s, in the, in the 2010s, there was this uh, push to, towards making Japan's aid more transparent. Um, you can see it also through the adoption of ODA, Official Development Assistance Charters. So Japan has had an ODA charter, uh, three of them, in 1992, 2003, and in 2015, the current one, which is called the Development Corporation Charter. And I think it was a gradual sort of push towards that kind of, uh, you know, greater transparency, accountability to the public, especially in the 2010s, because there was also a push from Japan's population, you know, a question in Japan, why is Japan providing foreign aid, uh, you know, it's taxpayer money or whatever not. So uh, it's not only accountability towards the recipients, but also to vis-a-vis -vis the Japanese public uh, as well. Uh, I think there were some, you know, scandals associated with Japanese ODA in the in the 1980s or 70s, and there was criticism. Uh, and I think you even have some uh, Japanese uh, uh, popular culture films uh, talking about that, sort of tackling that in a fictional way, but you know, uh, deal, you know, drawing from the news content. Uh, but I think that that's what, something that has been ad addressed uh, systematically and gradually over the past 25, 30 years. And uh, definitely, in, I think uh, I, it may have affected aid to Central Asia in the sense that Japan tried to make sure that aid uh, is, how to say, it, gets to the final destination, get, you know, benefits the, you know, the, or the ultimate, the, the people that it should benefit. Uh, and so that's how the mechanisms were, you know, redevised in that sense. But yeah, I, I can only, uh, yeah, say something general like this here. I haven't studied that specific aspect in detail academically. <laughs> Um, thank you, Nikolai. Before I, I um, uh, get the next uh, question in, I just wanted to sneak in a question from me since I'm the chair. I, 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 I have to wait always, but I'm going to sneak in a question right now um, and, and try to uh, bring the conversation a little bit to uh, what, um, well, you mentioned the BRI and you mentioned, I mean, the, 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 the uh, title of the, the conversation is uh, not so new Silk Road. So um, I guess my, my, my what I was thinking of was uh, whether the idea of the Silk Roads as a historic entity uh, was uh, used by Japan in the early 1990s or, or in the 1990s uh, as much as it is being used, um, well, in some cases uh, by China and, and by the West really, because you know the, the, even the terminology is really European. Uh, and Western um, in a way. Uh, so I guess my question is, and, and then again, part of the whole discussion, like how much does actually Japan feel like it is part of the Silk Road, uh, especially uh, when it's talking to say, it's, you know, the Western counterparts, because again, it kind of is all about Europe and China. It's not even about Central Asia. It's not about Russia, it's not about any of that stuff. It's really about um, Europe and, and China. So how, just the gender, if you have a feeling of, of, of how Japan used that, that would be great, thanks. Thank you. Look, again, again, the question is who in Japan, I think, because you have some of the, what they would call uh, sentimental or romantic connotations. Uh, there was this famous documentary in the late 1980s about the Silk Road on the Japanese television. And it talked about how the uh, history of development of Buddhism in Central Asia and Afghanistan. Uh, and that I think is something that has really resonated with uh, members of the public. Uh, you know, in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a strong way. So, for instance, when you had the uh, Taliban destroying the statues in Bamiyan and so on, I think there was a, uh, an effort in Japan to, well, first, I think they, they, they tried to save those statues, negotiate. Then I think there was some ideas of a laser holographic projection or uh, by someone whose name is Yamagata Hiro, uh, who is known to for this sort of laser kind of technology, uh, Hiro Yamagata. Uh, and then you also have some interesting actors, which are non-state actors, uh, like a Buddhist society, Soka Gakkai International, that has been uh, helping and has been operating in Surkhandarya, I think, uh, and uh, somewhere where you have this sort of archaeological uh, remnants uh, and you know, some vestiges of that sort of culture, but also in Afghanistan as well. 
So if, if, if it's someone in Japan who is interested in this sort of heritage and this sort of link from in Buddhism, definitely that resonates. And I think I, I've recently, where was it that I've traveled in Japan that I saw in the very, or one of the early Buddhist temples, I think they had some uh, imagery from Afghanistan uh, that would indicate some links from way, 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 you know, like a thousand years ago or something. Um, so there is that level. But then of course, uh, there is the kind of hard reality of global value chains, Japan adjusting to value chains, how the value chains changed during globalization uh, in the aftermath of the Soviet collapse, uh, and how you know this these post-Soviet economies get uh, or transition or you know get integrated in those new value chains, and Japan is, Japan is part of those value chains, of course. Um, so then, yeah, a, a lot of that language uh, you know uh, gets used in diplomacy, uh, and uh, I wonder in terms of. Because I have some, had some interviews with, with the corporate uh, respondents, uh, and uh, they, they would often bring up those sort of historical aspects. They wouldn't talk just about Central Asia as this sort of uh, locale for location for some projects or another project. They would talk about the whole sedentary and nomads, the difference between you know, Turkic and Persian. <laughs> and you know, you sit in the office, you talk to a business guy from one of the big corporations, then it's quite interesting to see how he is informed by that perspective. I'm not saying necessarily, like sometimes I felt there was a bit of a determinism saying, oh, well, you know, these people are sedentary, so it's easier to do business with them while those aren't. <laughs> and I wonder if that may have been a bit simplistic. I don't know to what, to what extent it has affected decision-making in that company or not, but um, definitely there was awareness of something more than just statistics uh, in, in that sense. Now, whether there was this sort of, projected commonality, whether there was this uh, sentiment, is another question. I think an important memory is uh, the that of the prisoners of war, Japanese prisoners of war, uh, a story that you often hear about the Navoi theater in Tashkent, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So this is a human connection uh, that, uh, you know, has remained, and, you know, it's a human network. But what I haven't studied is the possible linkage between that human network, between Japan and Uzbekistan, and uh, specific business operations, like how that is specifically used. I know that during the DPG administration, uh, Foreign Minister Gemba, Koichiro Gemba, I think he originally is from Fukushima, and uh, the prefecture. And Fukushima, the prefecture, had those ties with Uzbekistan. Uh, I think also referring to those prisoners of war ties. And so he, as a foreign minister hailing from that prefecture, tried to sort of really kind of step up that relationship. Again, that's more of a kind of humanitarian aspect than it is of this, uh, you know, kind of political political economy. Thank you, thanks, uh, Nikolai. Okay, um, Oyuna Baldakova has the next question. Yes, uh, thank you so much for such an interesting talk. Um, I think my question was partially uh, answered already by Professor Saxena about the uh, added value and the industrial uh, cooperation between Japan and Central Asian states. But maybe you can expand on this. If there is such a program like an industrial co cooperation program, if the Japanese companies were supported by the state to invest uh, in terms of FDI into the Central Asian states and build some uh, you know, facilities there. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I think this uh, has been the case uh, early on. Some of the Japanese companies have been present in Central Asia. I think this was the case with maybe Mitsui and Mitsubishi uh, from already the Soviet era, late Soviet era or, or so. Definitely, I think that's the case for Mitsui. Um, and so, well, I can name it some of them, but they are the sort of, whenever, whenever you come, whenever you talk about Japan and mention the trading houses, you usually have the same group of what they would call the usual suspects. So to say Mitsui, Mitsubishi, Itochu, uh, Sumitomo, uh, Sojits, which I think used to be initially Nisho Iwai, all of them in one form or the other are involved in uh, different operations in uh, Central Asia. Mining uh, is what springs to mind, uh, whether it's uranium mining uh, or, or rare earth. Then you have Japanese companies involved in, 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 in oil and gas on the Caspian offshore in, in Kazakhstan. Uh, I think that the recent trend has been 
And that's where you have the sort of linkage between industrial cooperation and uh, aid is, uh, is Japanese uh, cooperation with Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan, what I've mentioned in the power generation. So you, I think, gas turbine technologies, I might be getting the exact technology wrong, but you have this different technologies involving uh, gas, uh, gas to liquid and whatnot, and uh, gas powered, uh, electric power generation. Um, definitely in Turkmenistan over the past maybe nine years or so, maybe some before that, but I think there was a sort of a market step up around 2012-2013 and thereafter, and then in Uzbekistan uh, as well, uh, on top of what I've uh, mentioned uh, before. Uh, well, then I think Toyota has started producing or assembling vehicles in uh, in in Kazakhstan, I believe, uh, and then uh, uh, Uzbekistan has had the assembly line of uh, Isuzu, I think. The question of that is the exact sort of value added segment. Uh, some of that is more of an assembly and uh, in a large part is, is done in, in Japan or elsewhere. Uh, but uh, that, that's something that you know maybe is uh, open to future development. Um, with uh, I think, of course, it, it's hard to compare with, for instance, uh, Chinese businesses, which are much more present. It's a different kind of presence in that sense. But I think the uh, the, the value of investment is measured around billions. If, if we look at the region, uh, that's sort of order of magnitude. I think I have the exact figure, unfortunately, not on top of my head, but there was a policy paper that I've uh, published a couple of years ago for the French Institute of International Relations. And I have uh, figures there uh, for specific countries. So, um, yeah, but then the question, of course, is about the investment environment in a specific uh, Central Asian country and how that changes uh, under different leaders, successive leaders. So there were periods of sort of Japan's early stage infatuation, uh, you know, kind of euphoria, enthusiasm with Uzbekistan in the 1990s. Later on, that has, I think, stagnated a little bit towards the end of the 2010s. But then there has been possibly another gradual rebound uh, quite slow. In the meantime, Kazakhstan initially, which didn't have sort of much interest for Japan, gradually actually increased uh, the interest as the sort of uh, economic conditions improved there in the late 90s and especially the 2000s. Um, so yeah, that's uh, roughly what I have on the top of my head, but maybe if you want some more figures, I can you know point you uh, uh, to specific sources, whether it's my publications or elsewhere separately. Okay, uh, so we have eight minutes and I have three people in line. So what I'm going to do is ask all three to ask their questions one by one and then you try to answer in a holistic way after that. Is that okay, Nikolai? Okay. Okay. Thank you. So David, we, and, and if I could ask the people who are asking questions to keep their questions short. I'm really sorry, I apologize uh, for doing that. But So David and then Sergey and then Seljuk. I've put my comments in the chat because um, it was basically to do some of the issues that have been mentioned at times about Japan's involvement in the Silk Road in the early period. And I've mentioned in, in the chat, chat that there's some evidence of contact going back to the seventh century AD or earlier. Um, I don't need to go into all of that. Um, so maybe leave it at that, okay. Oh, and I also commented about uh, involvement in Mongolia, at least in the 1990s and onwards. So taking a broader perspective, I can see that Japanese involvement in Central Asia was wider than the five republics. And you might also want to consider the involvement with Mongolia. Mongolia. You have referred to Azerbaijan a bit now since my comment in, in the chat. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you. Are you still here? You can read Sergey's question um, uh, out in that. Um, um, sorry. Global yeah, warm is the global warm that is bound to keep. Uh, he, he's, he's, yeah. he's back. He can. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, oh. Hello, hello, Nikolai. Um, so my question is. Um, is, um, isn't the Arctic route supposed to be a new competitor for the new Silk Road? 
especially with the advent of the global warming when the, when the seas aren't going to be frozen as long. And if that is the case, is Russia going to mess it up due to its inherent corruption? So the new Silk Road project will continue logistics-wise as it's supposed to continue. Thanks, that was my question. Thank you for that. And then you, Seljuk. Uh, Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. I really enjoyed Murashkin's talk. I follow your publications. I happen to be a historian. Uh, and if you look at our recent book that came out of Brill, uh, Japan on the Silk Road, uh, Encounters and Perspectives in Eurasia, it's uh, pretty much about, you know, the pre-war uh, cultural vision, strategic vision of the Japanese elites on the Silk Road, they, they, they're very, uh, they developed a very, I think, unique uh, perception, connecting themselves uh, personally through various theories. I don't want to get into that, but uh, all I'd like to say is that this doesn't show so much in the contemporary public discussions, but the Japanese have an extraordinary accumulation of scholarly study of the Silk Road. In other words, if you're gonna, you know, be interested in medieval languages, uh, just go to Toyo Bunko, you know, Tokyo University, mm -hmm. and the scholars are there. You know, uh, the most uh, maybe esoteric aspects of uh, the cultural legacy. Uh, needless to say, because of this book, I became familiar with people from Ryukoku University that I'd like to mention. They're a very strong center for uh, um, Eurasian uh, cultural studies because of their Buddhist involvement. And of course, the involvement of Count Otani, whom, as you know, with the three expeditions, brought a lot of material. Some of it is in uh, Korea. But the other material is still unstudied in Japan, in Ryukoku. And I know that they accomplished one project of literally uh, rebuilding the walls with Buddhist frescoes that were taken to Berlin and destroyed under the bombardment during the Second World War. So they developed the technology to reconstruct those walls from the photographs of uh, Alex von der Kock and uh, they're hoping to cooperate with the Chinese authorities, you know, and to put them back into those empty halls in the um, temple ru ruins, you know, in Xinjiang. And another project is revival of Samarkand paper, which as you know, was the best paper period, you know, at some point uh, in uh, pre-modern uh, Eurasia. So they have a project of, you know, remaking it. Now, it might seem a little ephemeral to you, but I think that these projects indicate a special type of, you know, cultural connectivity to some of the legacies of uh, uh, the peoples of uh, the region. That's all. I mean, it's just my comment. Thank you very much. I truly enjoyed this discussion. Thank you very much. Okay, Nicola, you have two okay. minutes to respond to whatever you'd like uh, in the last recall. Okay, well, it's a blitz. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, look, excellent questions. Uh, so yeah, I'll, I'll go in, in the order that they've been uh, asked. Uh, so uh, yes, uh, the, there are, I think Central Asia perhaps uh, with, Japan's relations with Central Asia have been developed more actively than with Caucasus in the 90s and in the 2000s. Of course, Azerbaijan is a separate story um, because of uh, you know its economic attraction uh, for Japan and for some Japanese companies. Um, but I think over the past, uh, maybe in the past 10 years or so, there has been definitely some tangible projects in Georgia and Armenia. I think in terms of scale, it's still a smaller scale than what Japan would have accumulated in Central Asia. Uh, but I, I can see you know for every now and then projects in Georgia and Armenia coming up. Japan has had a framework similar to Central Asia plus Japan called Guam plus Japan, uh, which I think involved uh, Georgia and, and Azerbaijan. I'm not sure, I haven't been following that framework. Uh, uh, maybe it is you know, uh, live and, and so on. And Karagan. Yeah, 
Karik with fully engaging with all yeah. the stuff here. Of course, of course. Yeah, Karik, of course, indeed, Monty, thank you. Um, has the uh, yeah, Caucasian players as well. So uh, I think different in a different historic period uh, towards now, you have more of an engagement with that. Uh, uh, especially with these different connectivity projects between the EU and Japan, and then how Caucasus is becoming part of that. Um, so yeah, maybe there is some prospect uh, for the future. Now going to the second question about the Arctic. Well, I think we have to be using uh, plural. Uh, uh, thank you for the question. We have to be using plural rather than singular terms. I think there are new silk roads in, in you know with, with an S and uh, the Arctic is often regarded as a cold silk road or the polar silk road or the Arctic silk road and so on. A lot of the Arctic connectivity of course has to do, uh, while it's about global warming, it's also about uh, li liquefied natural gas. It's about the LNG prospects there uh, where Japan is interested and has been investing in those projects uh, in uh, you know those run by Russia's uh, Novatech, I believe. Uh, with the corruption, look, that would be a separate subject of study, whether in Russia or elsewhere. Uh, I don't think corruption is specific to only Russia, although it, you know, it certainly exists there, and you know, it's uh, it has been discussed a lot. But I think that you know can be uh, a, a problem in many countries, and I think that's where uh, it's interesting to see the debate on the role of so-called crony capitalism in uh, Asian financial crisis, because. Uh, there was a debate about what caused the 1997 Asian financial crisis, and uh, the U.S. argued that it was mostly crony capitalism, uh, specific to East Asia, according to the United States, uh, while Japan said, well, no, look, it's more of a liquidity crisis. And so there was a clear uh, disagreement there, and uh, clearly, you know, different sides were using the term corruption for one or other political purpose. So it's also important to sort of see the context uh, behind specific uh, usage of that term. So uh, I, I think uh, Japan is interested in the new Silk Road. And I think before the Crimean crisis, uh, Japanese companies were actually very interested in uh, particularly, I think, shipping uh, routes. I think oh, Mitsui OSK, which of the Japanese shipping companies is it? They were definitely very interested in, in stepping up their game in the Arctic. Now, uh, to Professor Essenberg's question, uh, thank you. I have that. I have your book. I uh, reviewed it and uh, I really enjoyed it. Uh, and uh, it's so rich in terms of you know content and the ground that it covers. Um, I think the main story here is that for Japan, the war is this very thick line that divides the past. And so a lot of things that were pre-war, they get perhaps not always in a justified way, but they get automatically kind of tainted as you know, with a negative connotation. Now, some of that, you know, was quite, you know, an adventurist, what <laughs> some of the Japanese uh, people were doing in Central Asia. And then some of that wasn't. Some of that was indeed very, you know, cultural sort of connectivity, as you say. Uh, but I think because some of that is now retroactively interpreted as, you know, sort of pre-war, uh, there might be a bit of a sort of emotional distance that some uh, politicians are taking. Because of course, you know, for me as a scholar of contemporary, Policy. It's interesting how these things translate into policy making and contemporary diplomacy, and that's perhaps where they just you know wouldn't be much brought up uh, because it would have to do with Japan's with the competition between the Japanese Empire and the Russian Empire or the USSR. Uh, Abdul Rashid Ibrahim, you know the, the stories of uh, that are very interesting, uh, but uh, you know they would evoke more conflictual patterns in relations that. Uh, now that you know post soviet russia and uh, japan that is post war would rather not evoke in in their uh, diplomatic rhetoric uh, but um yeah i think at the level of uh, scholarship it's fantastic i think i've once uh, met uh, komatsu sensei uh, thanks to the recommendations from uh, cambridge central asia forum and uh, yeah he uh, shared with me his article in russian that he published in russian about abdul rashid ibrahim uh, and uh, yeah uh, that was something that where I've learned a lot myself. Brilliant. I think that's a perfect place to stop. Uh, it's very late in Japan, so I don't want to keep you any longer. Uh, we're four minutes over. Thank you so much for uh, finding time and, and uh, spending uh, time with us. Thank you also to all the people who attended. Um, and thank you for a brilliant discussion. Uh, we will be in touch. We do still have a few more talks uh, lined up for the next couple of months. Uh, so I will be in touch with uh, all of you uh via email um and then i think that's it uh, so it's lunchtime here it's um, 
bedtime in Japan, I guess. <laughs> thank you, Nikolai. Thanks very much. Bye. Thank, thank you, all of you. Pleasure. Bye. That was great. Thank you. Arigato. Arigato. Oh,